Good morning, church. Welcome to church. We're glad to have you here with us today. We hope the service is a blessing to you, energizes your faith, reminds you again of why you believe what you believe, strengthened by your relationship with God, encouraged by your relationships and your friendships that you forge here. We pray that your week will be strengthened for the journey ahead. Thank you again for being with us today. Today is our communion Sunday. We invite all who are with us today, visitors included, to participate as you feel comfortable. We have an open communion table. We believe that Jesus would never turn anyone away, and neither would we. So glad to have you here. Uh, we have some announcements for you to include. We invite all of you to join us for fellowship hour after church. Go down this hallway to the very end. We've got coffee and treats uh, provided for us, and so we're looking forward to the tasty uh, meal and girth-producing benefits of it. We'd like to welcome everyone worshiping with, with us online. We thank you for very much for joining with us today. We hope the service is a blessing to you. Later in the service, we will be having communion. So now would be a good time for you to gather your elements at home, whether it's bread or juice, and be prepared, if you want, to follow along with us in our service. We have two meetings today after church. We have a facility usage task force. It's meeting 1115 in my office. We invite those who are on that task force to join us. And then at 11.30 a.m., we have a worship team meeting in my office. And so we're going to figure out how to do both of those pretty much near the same time. But we'll both get them done. We've got a lot to discuss, but we'll get it done uh, readily. Last week, the last Sunday of every month, we take up a compassion fund offering that goes to fund uh, the efforts that we do for the unhoused and those who are in need around our community. I forgot to take that offering. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to take that offering. That's the wooden plates. We'll pass those around when it comes to you. This money goes to help uh, feed the poor. Uh, with we, we, we provide sack lunches for them. We provide hats, gloves, scarves, socks, and blankets. And so we, they're always readily available, and uh, the fund provides for that. All, all, and also gift cards for McDonald's. So when we run out of the gift sacks, we give the gift cards so that there's always food. So we invite you to participate as you feel comfortable. On Wednesday at 6.30, we are continuing our Lenten study. We watch a video in Fellowship Hall. Max Licato's got this great video called Anxious for Nothing. And it's, it helps us to better understand how to move our anxieties or lessen our anxieties. We look at scripture, we look at our faith, we talk about it, we ask questions, we eat, or we eat soup. And so we invite you to participate. You don't have to have come to every one of them. Each session is its own standalone session. So if this interests you, we invite you to participate. And finally, we are, uh, council voted last week to, uh, where did I put that flyer? Here it is. We are doing a piano repair fundraiser. It's not very much, it's $1,700, but we need to refix this grand piano that plays in our sanctuary. It's okay for hymns, as I understood, but there's technical things about it that prevent people who want to rent out our facility to uh, make it sound better. And so it, am I saying that accurately enough? So we're, uh, we're having a fundraiser. So if you'd like to uh, donate to this, we invite you to do so, and we'll get that fixed as soon as possible. All right, those are my announcements. Do we have other announcements we'd like to lift up? Randy. Yes, um, it is the uh, custom of our congregation to applaud after the postlude, which our music director very much appreciates. However, during Lent, we ask that you hold your applause um, after the postlude. So applause after the postlude only, but not during the rest? No, no, no. Uh, during Lent. During Lent. But please do not applaud after the postlude. We're asking you not to applaud after the postlude. Yes. And so we'll just be solemn. Yes. I'm preaching about that you, today. You can, There's you something to solemn solemnity. You can uh, express your appreciation directly to uh, our, our um, wonderful music director after the service, but please do not. Did you, you all hear that? We invite you to, uh, if you'd like to express your appreciation to approach Dr. Jones after the service or the choir, let them know how well they did, but we're going to withhold from clapping. Thank you very much. Anything else? All right, church family. Um, I invite you to join us in our welcoming gathering call as printed in your order of worship.
I forgot one announcement. We do have some visitors here with, with us today, and I just want to let you know that our entire order of service is really directed in our bulletin. It's a big bulletin, but you can find everything we're doing here. Feel free to participate as you feel comfortable. With that in mind, let us begin our worship today by saying aloud our opening scripture. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Church family, visitors, friends, let me invite you to stand as you feel comfortable and greet one another with the peace of Christ. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also, and also with you. Be with you. Be with you. Will you please join me to call to worship? The grace, grace of Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Our lips sing praise and our whole selves rejoice in the God who makes us free. We gather recognizing that not all human beings have known this freedom. The divine will was made known in Eden and Egypt, in Gettysburg and Cape Town. you now to join me in our opening prayer. Let us pray together. Uh, thankful are we for all the blessings of this life, love, bounty, and beauty. The joy we know is beyond our words to speak. We can only imagine the suffering and pain of human slaves, past and present, which yearn from the depths of their souls to know the freedom we enjoy. We celebrate this day, the heritage we have 
in the cause of human freedom. We celebrate this day our spiritual ancestors who worked for the freedom of many people on the slave ship, Amistad. May that ship, like the cross, remind us of the power of divine love. May we, through divine love, shed the false, unneighborly, covetous, and dishonorable desires of the lives we sometimes live and keep the commandments and walk in the way that brings life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Sunday of every month, we have a prayer of confession that gives us an opportunity to connect with God by recognizing that, that we need God in our lives. We invite you to participate in our prayer of transformation. Let us pray. In this season of Lent, we reflect on those things that lead us away from the life we desire. We focus on that which we do that oppresses and enslaves others like us are created in the image of God. And so we seek the grace that frees us to live in faithfulness to holy love. Let us now observe a moment of silence that gives us an opportunity to connect with God on a personal level. The God who brought the Israelites out of Egypt is the power that frees us from our sins. Live in the grace of God's love as you walk in the way of Jesus, and surely you shall find mercy at the end of that road. In Christ, we have the fullness of God's mercy and grace. Thanks be to God. Amen. In your bulletin, you will notice a psalm reading, and that's not the reading for today. We changed everything midweek, and so... We've made some changes. The bulletin's a little wonky. We invite you to listen as Levi reads our First Corinthians epistle lesson. And so if you would read the epistle lesson at the bottom mm -hmm. and not at the top. <laughs> God bless us all. From 18. 1, 18 through 25. The message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction. But we who are being saved notice the very power of God. As the scripture says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and discard the intelligence of the intelligent. So where does this leave the, the philosophers, the scholars, and the world's most brilliant debaters? God has made the wisdom of this world look foolish, since God is, in his wisdom saw to it that the world would never know him through human wisdom. He has used our foolish preachings to save those who believe. It is foolish to the Jews who ask for signs from heaven, and it is foolish to the Greeks who seek human wisdom. So when we preach that Christ was crucified, the Jews are offended, and the Gentiles say it is all nonsense. But to those called by God to salvation, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. The foolish plan of God is wiser than the wisest of human plans, and God's weakness 
is, the strong, is stronger than the greatest of human strength. Next, what can be found in the bulletin is the scripture lesson from John 2, 13 to 22. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration, so Jesus went to Jerusalem. In the temple area, he saw merchants selling cattle, sheep, and doves for sacrifices. He also saw dealers at the table exchanging foreign money. Jesus made a, made a whip from some rope and chased them out of the temple. He drove out the sheep and cattle, scattered the, the money ch changers' ch coins over the floor, and turned over their tables. Then, going over, over to the people who sold doves, he told them, Get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. Then his disciples remembered this prophecy from the scripture. Passion of God's house will consume me. But the Jewish leaders demanded, what are you doing? If God gave you authority to do this, show us a miraculous sign to prove it. All right, Jesus replied, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. What? They exclaimed. It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you can rebuild it in three days? But when Jesus said, said this, this temple, he meant his own body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered he had said this, and they believed both the scripture and what Jesus had said. This is the word of the Lord. Let us respond by singing together our scripture refrain. <laughs> Jesus and Holy God, we thank you for gathering us in your house today that we might experience you in many ways. We thank you for your revelation to us through the liturgy, through the hymns that we sing, through the communion in which we're about to participate, and in this morning message. I pray, gracious God, that you will speak to us, and I pray, gracious one, that the meditations of my heart and the words of my mouth will bring you praise, O oh God, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Many, 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 many years ago, I was a student at Union Theological Seminary in New York City. And I had a job while I was in school. And so my job was to record uh, the things that went on at the school. So I, I was the video guy. And so I would often record uh, lectures from students. I would record things that went on, special ceremonies. And then I would also interview or, or videotape interviews for positions uh, that came open for professorships. And so when Vincent Wimbush, the esteemed New Testament scholar, left Union Theological, we were looking for his replacement. And so a few candidates had made it a long way, and so they were giving a, a, a test lecture in front of us at Union. Now, if you knew Union, union students, we're kind of prickly. And, and I guess all seminary students are that way. We all think we know everything, right? And so here's a professor, and they're being judged not by so much what they say, but how they respond to us. A really good professor takes a student's question and turns it in such a way that invites the student to participate in dialogue. And, and sometimes when a student gets all self-righteous, the really good professor turns that into a beautiful conversation to which afterwards they become great friends. We had this particular professor that, I, well, I, uh, someone applying for the professorship that I didn't quite understand why he made it this far. And he gets up there and he starts and he starts talking and his whole idea was that Jesus was this pacifist, that he never did anything that would even give a hint that he was not pacifist. And he went on for about 20 minutes and he was waxing poetic about we should be pacifists too because Jesus is a pacifist. Now I recognize there are, there are many pacifist traditions in which we honor, we celebrate, we understand that perspective, but it was just interesting how he was making that point. And so somewhere toward the end when he asked for questions, I raised my hand. And he thought 
oh, excuse me, Mr. Videographer, is there something wrong with the camera? And they said, oh, no, no, I think there's something wrong with what you're saying. <laughs> and he goes, what? And I said, well, you say that Jesus was this pacifist who never did anything violent or of any nature, but what about when he stormed the temple and he overturned, he made a, a whip and he overturned the tables and he and chased out the money changers from the temple. I would say that was a violent act, wouldn't you? And the professor was flumbuxled. He was, uh, uh, and he was looking through his notes and I didn't mean to catch him like that. I was trying to ask a question and he acknowledged, well, yeah, there's that. <laughs> and so he ultimately wasn't chosen but it was an interest to be the professor, but it was interesting to see how he interpreted what I had to say. And then in the end, acknowledged that what I had to say was an important point. But it's really interesting when we think about this person of Jesus, what it means to, what he means to us, how we look at this Jesus. There are many different ways in which people look to Jesus and they understand him from very different perspectives. Some people even think that their understanding is the right one and that everyone else has missed the point. But in our scripture lesson for today, we read where certain people focus on one thing or another and think that they focus on uh, is, is correct. In our epistle lesson, the apostle Paul is explaining how some people just couldn't try as they might understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. To the unbelieving Jews, Paul says they were offended about the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus interpreted as the Christ of our faith. Perhaps they were thinking the Christians were misappropriating their understanding of animal sacrifices in the temple. After all, we say that Jesus died for our sins. And so to them, they found that to be offensive. Now, you know that when the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, uh, temple sacrifices ceased across all Jewish practice. There has not been any type of sacrifice offered since the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. But before that temple was destroyed, these Jews were thinking, here are Christians trying to misappropriate our understanding, and it was, an offensive, it was offensive to them. And then there were the unbelieving Greek philosophers. The idea that our world even needs saving in the first place was nothing but nonsense to them. But Paul wasn't deterred. His point is to make a case for Christ, a theological and spiritual one. Paul believed that his faith perspective is one that we can hang our hats on if we're determined and devoted enough. Put another way, it takes a certain kind of devotion to understand the theology of God, a devotion found in scripture and congregational faith study. We also see here that Paul focuses a lot of his attention on the philosophers, scholars, and debaters. To them, their kind of knowledge, which sought logical conclusions based on their arguments outside of religious contexts, should conclude that Jesus and his followers were clearly unskilled in their understanding of how things actually work. These philosophers heard the arguments for believing and they weren't convinced. As a result, they would often confront early Christians. We have, there's a lot of things written about these philosophers confronting early Christianity and how it would oftentimes flambuxum the early Christians. And so they were taught to not engage these philosophers at any cost, at all cost, and they would avoid such confrontations. But there arose from within that kind of understanding certain Christian apologists who would teach the early Christians how to answer and defend their faith against those who misunderstood the Christian story. But Paul's point is that the message of Jesus and the Christ of our faith can be both misunderstood and sometimes offensive to people outside of the Christian faith tradition, and we shouldn't be surprised by it. Anyone who knows a vocal anti-religious person today has heard or read particular condemnations of Jesus. Facebook is full of memes making fun of Christianity. It seems to be a comedic platform sometimes. Everywhere it seems there are objections to believing in God, but interestingly, many of those objections we hear today were the same ones that we've heard over and over again all the way back to the first century. Paul ultimately explains that some people just won't understand or get it, and that the only way that they, 
and the only way they'll ever understand it is not through winning them over in conversation or argument, but to win them over in love. For that kind of love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Some people just like to argue. You know who they are. They're your relatives, right? They're your good friends. They're the people that gather around you at Thanksgiving or Christmas and just like to argue to get a rise out of you. Have you ever really won someone over to the faith arguing with them about what it means to be a Christian? No. They got a point, you got a point, they got a point, you got a point, you're arguing, they're shouting. What comes from that type of engagement? Well, maybe an upset stomach. Maybe that's why tongues was invented. Alka-Seltzer, right? You just get your blood boiling because they just won't listen to you, but they're saying the same thing about you. And it's that type of argumentation that the older I get, the more I realize how fruitless it is. But you know what isn't fruitless? When they're scared, when they lost a loved one, when they're sick and you go to them and you don't try to force them to believe what you believe, you ask them how they're doing. You say, can I bring you some soup? Are you gonna be okay today? We're praying for you today in church. I know you don't wanna hear that, but we're praying for you today. And it's interesting how such kindness and love demonstrates a greater argument toward belief than any theological pointing your finger in their face will ever do. There are just different ways in which people understand Jesus, and there are different perspectives on how people understand who he was. And it's important that we recognize the moment and try to inject as much love as we possibly can. Interestingly enough, in our gospel lesson, we read about a Jesus that is very different from perhaps sometimes the Jesus that we think of. The Jesus in the toga, the long hair, dude. He, Jesus Was Jesus Californian, right? And did he just kind of hang out and want peace and love and, has, and hide Asbury Park, whatever that place is in California, right? Je, was Jesus a hippie, you know? Hey, dude, just, let's love each other, right? Well, he was kind of that, but he was also something else. And we read about that something else in our account in the gospel lesson. We read where Jesus walks into the temple, sees the money changers, they're selling sacrificial animals and other items to purchase, and Jesus freaks out. Perhaps Jesus felt the temple was being desecrated by such a transactional approach to the faith. So he fashions a whip and snaps it at the merchants, driving them out of the temple as he overturns their tables, scatters their money across the floor, and creates this huge fiasco. To Jesus, selling anything inside the temple was wrong, even though the law required that for certain sins, sacrifices had to be made on the altar. And if you lived in the city, you didn't own all these animals that needed to be sacrificed. So what's the problem? We read in the other gospel accounts, because this story is found in all four gospel accounts. We read how the, the, the merchants were thieves and they were cheating the people because they, he, they knew they needed these sacrifices and they didn't offer the best of the animals, they offered the worst of their animals. At least that's how the other gospel writers explain it. What we read here is that Jesus is ticked off that it's even happening to begin with. If you follow my Facebook post, you know that I posted a Facebook church devotion this week. I do so every Wednesday at 12 noon. And I told you the story about a church that I grew up in that had the fight of all fights to end all fights when they decided to put a soda pop machine in the gymnasium foyer. And the, the idea was that the soda pop machine would pay for the equipment used in the gym because the gym was open Monday through Friday after school from 2.30 to 5. And we went through basketballs and volleyballs and all sorts of equipment. It needed cleaning equipment. So in order to get that paid for, it was decided to put a soda pop machine in the foyer. Well, oh my gracious, the people, half the church freaked out. Don't you read this story in John where Jesus gets mad at people selling things inside the church? This is a desecration of the, of the church of God. <laughs> you know, even this Baptist church. And it was just interesting how they were fighting over this. It took some time and much convincing, but the soda pot machine was allowed to stay. And, but it was just really an interesting argument, thinking, well, gosh, should we ever sell anything in the church? 
Congregational churches, churches all across the, uh, everywhere have bingo games in them, right? Sometimes we sell cookies and different I- items. Is that considered appropriate? Well, I think that's different than what happens on an altar in a church. Now, what if we had stands set up here in which we sold to you things? Well, that would feel kind of icky, wouldn't it? I think it would feel icky. Jesus was just frustrated that he believed that this whole idea, what was that word that he used? Transactional approach to our faith that was being used in, within the sanctuary itself. And he freaked out over this. We find the other gospels also reporting this story. So we know this story has a lot of truth in it. John's gospel is the only story that, that the, is the only time that this story is presented at the beginning of Jesus's ministry. All the other gospels report that this story happens at the end of his ministry as he's walking into to Jerusalem toward Calvary. What's the difference of putting it at the beginning and the end? I don't know, but it's just an interesting thing to point out. But what we find here is, is this Jesus who's a man of personal, religious, passionate conviction. He isn't just this guru who sits and gives wise things, but he has something in his heart to teach us. So what's the point of these two lessons? I believe Jesus is teaching us an important lesson as did the apostle Paul. In both scripture lessons, we're being taught that following Jesus isn't a simple argument or a simple expectation of religious practice. It is that, it is that, but it's more than that. Following Jesus isn't just checking off a box on a form and signing I agree to a statement of theological purpose. Sure, there are a few expectations of what we do and believe, but the crux of our faith is not about that. I believe the crux of our faith is about a relationship with God. To see it any other way is to misunderstand the importance of a relationship and love between God, each other, and ourselves. Does that make sense? Do you see where I'm going with this? To Paul, following Jesus wasn't simply an argument that proves Jesus' death does one thing or another. It isn't like a terms of agreement that you click on a software update on your computer. And to Jesus, it isn't about the dishonest transactional approach of buying and selling. Following God was about connecting ourselves with God reverently, intentionally, and on purpose. It is more than paying an offering or a tithe or feeding the poor, or, and it's more than understanding a catechism or theological point. Those things are important as they help us understand why we believe what we believe, but the most important thing that we're supposed to do is connect with God, which is what this meal is meant to help us do. When we eat of the bread and drink from the cup, we not only proclaim the mystery of our faith, but we participate in this thing called Christianity. And maybe we go back to our seats and we say, God, show me how it is that you live in me and that I live in you. And that together we approach our faith as one of doing things together. I think that's an important part that we need to keep in mind. I know many of you look at that and understand that very well and how important it is to connect with God. For when we connect with God, we can better connect with each other. Have you ever met the kind of person that just seems to, like they've got their act together? They're kind, they're good, they're honest. They're, they, you, you want to be around them and they want to be around you. There's something that I find when it comes to Christians who do that, that I just want to be around them more and, 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 and to be energized by their faith commitment. I know many people of faith who are just kind and non-judgmental and they don't point their finger at me. How many people here like to have fingers pointed at you? Does anybody here like to have their finger, someone's finger pointed at you? Nobody likes to have their fingers being pointed at. They want to be loved and appreciated. I was talking with a friend of mine just a couple of days ago and he was telling me this horrible story about his upbringing. And he never really feels like this safe, he's got a safe place or a safe person to talk about those experiences. And he says, I find that super duper religious people, I just feel judged when I'm around them. And he was telling me that he doesn't feel that way around me. Can we be the kind of person that someone can come to us and say, man, I've really screwed up, or man, I need someone to talk to. Can I talk to you? When we embrace the idea that we're meant to love God and we're meant to love one another as we love ourselves, we embrace 
all the teachings of the law and the prophets. We embrace all of what Jesus was instructing us to do. I pray, my friends, that you will strive to be the kind of person that loves on other people, that other people seek hope for, and that you will change their lives as your lives is being changed, and that all the while God is being glorified. Amen. At this time, as we sing our middle hymn, our ushers will come forward to collect your prayer requests to be prayed for later in the service. Or we can pray for in just a minute in the service. You may be seated. Let us pray. Gracious and holy and good and wonderful God, we thank you for connecting us with one another and making it so that when we, to, to, to make it in this world, we, we have to depend upon each other. We pray, holy God, that you will give us a love in our hearts for our friends and enemies, the people in our life that cross our path. Teach us compassion, gracious one. Help us to be empathetic, and where we lack in empathy, may we make up for in doing the right thing. Help us, Holy One, to reach out to those who need you, not with a judgmental attitude, but with a compassionate heart. I know many of us can, we've been through difficult times, Holy One, but it's been the, the love of our friends and family that have brought us through those things. We pray, Holy God, that we will be that kind of person. Forgive us when we're not. Show us, O oh Lord, how not to be jerks or self-righteous or holier than thou. Teach us to be kind and funny and warm and accepting. Show us, O oh Lord, how to do that well. We thank you, gracious God, for what it means to be in church, for the opportunities we have to engage and encourage one another. We thank you for the ministry that goes on here that lets us know that life is bigger than just us. We thank you for the ministries that you give us to do that include praying for and encourage one another, encouraging one another. So hear us, Lord, as we lift up two particular prayer requests to include Ellen, our beloved Ellen, who had a nasty fall. Doctors are looking over her right now. We pray that she will be okay. We continue to pray for Pinky's granddaughter, Cheyenne, who's going through some health issues. We pray, gracious God, that you will heal her and guide her toward better health. We pray for Vi's close friend, Judy, who is suffering from major back issues. 
for Latoya's sister, Lanesha, that God may continue to bless and watch her as she deals with new challenges in her life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for Kathy Garcia while she is going through chemotherapy for Gary Lee's mother, who is recovering from surgery. We pray for Betsy's daughter-in-law, Christina, who has an inoperable brain tumor, for Max, who has lymphoma, and for Alice, who has dementia. We pray for Betsy's eye problems. We know they're getting a little better. We pray that Ellen, who fell, will also find a suitable donor. We pray for Pinky as she recuperates and for my eldest brother, Joe, as he recovers from his health issues. We continue to pray, gracious God, for the ends of the war between Hamas and Israel and Ukraine and Russia. We pray for the release of the hostages as well. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for that, oh gracious, I'm trying to read this. Uh, uh, I'll get back to that. Uh, we pray for continued prayers for Ellen as she recovers from a fall and Marge as she, uh, what's this word, Pat? She what? Reduce uh, off her uh, prednisone. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for uh, someone's friend Dave as his recovery, as he gets off substance abuse. And we pray for God's protection over his health. We pray for Xander to recover from COVID-19 and for the safety of the Palestinians. We pray for my co Scott's cousin, Kelly. She has cancer and recently had to have surgery to stop some bleeding. We pray for her recovery. And Lord, we pray for this prayer request that I can't read. We pray that your spirit would be upon it and answer the need as, uh, as you can. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our church, oh God, that you'll guide our efforts of revitalization and that you'll help us to be the people that you've called us to be for this community. Guide us that we are a force for good here and that we invest ourselves in the kingdom and the reign of God. For we pray these prayers in the name of Jesus, our Christ, who taught us how to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So now we will be participating in our Lord's Supper. We invite you to participate as you feel comfortable. Um, we will read our liturgy together and then we will celebrate together. Eternal God who has created the heavens and the earth, giving breath to every living thing, we thank you for all the gifts of creation and for the gift of life itself. We thank you for making us in your own image, for forgiving us when we act as though we, you have no claim on us, and for keeping us in your steadfast care. We rejoice in Jesus Christ, the only one eternally begotten by you, who was born of your servant Mary and shared the joys and sorrows of life as we know it. We remember Christ's death, we celebrate Christ's resurrection, and in the beloved community of your church, we await Christ's return at the end of history. We take courage from the abiding presence of your Holy Spirit in our midst. We offer you our praise for people of faith in every age who stand as witnesses to your love and justice. With all the prophets, martyrs, and saints, and all the company of heaven, we glorify you by singing together.
think Jesus was really making a great point in the connection that he wants to have with us through the celebration of this meal. Every communion Sunday, I get up here and try to connect you with this important meal in our lives. In some faith traditions, this meal means a lot more, right? In some traditions, this becomes the actual body and blood of Christ. In the tradition of the United Church of Christ, we believe it's symbolic, but it's more than just symbolic. Martin Luther would often talk about the real presence that when you participate in this meal, God is present in a special way that God isn't present when you don't celebrate it. It kind of, does that make sense? Sort of, kind of. And it's the idea that this is a special gathering. And I would imagine his disciples didn't understand it at the moment when they went through it. But when they look back and Jesus having this last meal with them, it just meant the world to them the last time that they connected with God. And so we do that too. We gather the first Sunday of every month to find a way to connect with this person we think of as Jesus, this one who loved us, who cared for us, who showed us the way to life eternal with God. And so Jesus gathered his disciples following the feast of Passover as we celebrate that. And he took some bread and he broke it and he gave thanks to God and he gave it to his disciples and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Each time you eat this, do so to remember me. And in, this, in, in the same way, Jesus took the cup, probably the Elijah cup, and reinterpreted it. And after giving thanks to God, he gives it to his disciples. And he said, drink this, all of you, for this is the cup of my new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Each time you drink this, do so to remember me. It is for this reason that whenever we eat of the bread and drink from the cup, we proclaim the mystery of our faith, that Christ has died, that Christ has risen, that Christ will come again, and that Christ means something more to us than just those theological statements. God means something special to us. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, we thank you for these gifts. We pray that uh, they will be consecrated by your spirit and that you will bless us, that as we receive them at this table, we may offer you our faith and praise, that we may be united with Christ and with one another, and we may continue to be faithful in all things. Amen. So the bread that we take, what we do is we invite you to come forward. Our ushers will come your way. We invite you to take a piece of the bread and dip it into the cup, and then eat it. We also have gluten-free breads, if you are gluten sensitive, and we invite you to do that too. Would you come stand here and hold this? And so we invite you, the usher will come by you and come as you feel comfortable. And we invite you then to go back to your seats, spend some time talking with God. These are the gifts of God for you and I, the children of God. Come now, let us celebrate our faith in Jesus Christ.
Please join with me now in our prayer of thanksgiving. Let us pray. Bountiful God, we give you thanks that you've refreshed us at your table by granting us the presence of Christ. Strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, and send us forth into the world in courage and peace, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So now we will take our offering at the end of the service. As we mentioned at the beginning of the service, we're going to be taking up two offerings. So one offering will be the Compassion Fund first out of the wooden plates, and then the brass plates will be our regular offerings. Our tokens offered here are but symbols of our lives of sacrifice lived, lives of sacrifice lived every day. May we give ourselves to the world as a holy offering acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. We invite you to give in person on our website or mail in your offering today. Thank you. Please join with me in our prayer of dedication as we pray together. Receive these gifts, Holy One. Bless them and us with your spirit. Drive away any ill motives and accept, we pray, our humble offering. Amen.
invite you now to turn and face one another, either across the aisle or next to your best friend that you came here with, and let us sing together our commissioning song as printed in your order of worship. and sisters, strangers and friends, do not be dismayed by the brokenness in the world. All things break and all things can be mended, not with time, as they say, but with intention. So go, love intentionally, extravagantly, unconditionally. The broken world awaits in darkness for the light that is you. Go in peace. Amen.